Let's turn our Bibles to Psalm 15. Psalm 15. One of the things about having a uh, national tragedy like this is that you want to get back to the basics of Christianity, what it means to be a Christian. And so tonight we're going to ask ourselves a question, what does a Christian look like? What does a Christian look like? You know, being a Christian is far more than simply having a little fish on the back of your car. Uh, it's far more than having a bumper sticker that says something religious on the back of your car. It's far more than having a, a cap. I remember when I was growing up, I used to have a blaze orange cap that said, Praise the Lord. <laughs> that was a, a, a big thing when I was growing up. You know, Christianity is a lot more than simply uh, getting on Facebook and putting something up that says, you know, share if you love Jesus. You know, those things are always kind of interesting to me. As we look at Psalm 15, this is a psalm of David, and he's going to tell us how we can recognize who God's people are. And what David teaches us here is we can recognize God's people by how they honor God and treat others from day to day. We can recognize God's people by how they honor God and treat others day by day. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. We'll read Psalm 15. And David asks a question here. It says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please help us tonight as we look at our own lives to see if these characteristics of a true believer are in our lives. Heavenly Father, we pray you would take your word and convince us of our sin. Show us, first of all, if we're truly born again. But then if we are, by your Holy Spirit, show us areas in our lives which we need to improve in order to be a good representative of you as ambassadors for you here on this earth. Help the preacher tonight. Fill him with your spirit. Guide him and lead him, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. Here's a question. Who is going to heaven to live with God forever? That's a very important question, is it not? You know, I've been thinking a lot recently, and as I've said before since my uh, truck wreck uh, last year, that is about the fact that all of us are going to die, and that this life is so short compared to eternity. You know, I was watching about the uh, Indian mounds all over North America, and they're, uh, you know, old, from like 2,000 years old or greater, some of those Indian mounds. Thinking about the, the redwood trees, you know, 1,500 years old, the sequoia trees, perhaps 3,000 years old. And we think about our own lives and how short they are. This is really the ultimate question, is it not? And that is, who is going to heaven to live with God forever? Well, we notice that David here goes to the right source. Lord. You know, this is Jehovah. Whenever you see all caps, the word Lord. Jehovah, the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, the one true God, is the only one who can tell us who is going to heaven to live with him forever? And so we look to his word to get his guidance. And David asked, Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? The word abide here means to sojourn or to lodge. Tabernacle. Now let's get our timeline straight because the temple had not been built yet. The temple was built by David's son Solomon. And so the Ark of the Covenant the place where the sacrifices were given was at the tabernacle. This was a tent. It's where God would meet with his people and accept their sacrifices. 
You know, if David were writing today, he might reword his statement this way. He might say, Lord, Jehovah, who can be a part of thy church? Thy church. He asked another question. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now the word dwell is different than abide here. It means to permanently occupy. And the holy hill here is heaven. It's the new Jerusalem. So who is it that can be in fellowship with God's church? Who is it that can live forever in the new heavens and new earth when that new Jerusalem comes down? Well, let's look at John chapter 3 and get an answer to this. Because I don't want you to think as we go through Psalm 15 that I'm at all preaching a works-based salvation. John chapter 3. There's a guy named Nicodemus, a great Jewish teacher, comes to Jesus in John chapter 3. And Jesus says to him in verse number 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto Jesus, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. Now let's stop there. You know, why do we talk about being born again so much? Well, because the Bible says you must be born again. That is the only way to enter into God's kingdom is to be born again. Well, what does it mean to be born again? It means to be radically changed by God's Holy Spirit. And the question we ought to be asking as we think about, well, who is it that can fellowship in the church here on earth? Who is it that can dwell in heaven forever? The question ought to be, how can a man be born again? And that's the question Nicodemus asked, although he got a little bit confused about what Jesus was talking about here. Verse 8 says this. It says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. The wind you know, we've had these wonderful uh, drive-in services on Sunday morning, which is the best we can do for these conditions. You know, what do you notice every time as you look at the speaker? I never knew there was so much wind blowing in these mountains. But the wind blows, and whoever's preaching has to struggle with keeping the Bible straight and, and the notes straight and things like that. And You're always kind of wondering in the back of your mind, is that, is that tent that they're under going to blow over? <laughs> you know... The wind blows, but you cannot see it, but you see its effects. And that's what Psalm 15 is talking about. And that is, you know, we cannot see within a man's heart to see whether or not he's right with God. But as we look at his life, we can tell by his life whether God's done a work there. Well, verse number 9 of John 3, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? How can I be born again? And Jesus wonderfully answers that after he chides him a little bit. Beginning of verse number 13. And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. He's saying there, you know what, Nicodemus? You've come to the right place. I've been to heaven. I have perfect fellowship with the Father in heaven. I can answer that question for you. Verse number 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In the wilderness, the Israelites were given to sinning and complaining, and one day God sent poisonous snakes among them to judge them. And the people cried out, and Moses cried out, and God told Moses, build you a, a bronze serpent and put it on a stick. And hang it high. What a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why a serpent? Because it represented sin. Jesus became sin for us. And when we look to, when we believe in, when we trust in 
The one who became sin for us and took our penalty on the cross. Then guess what? We have eternal life. Verse number 16 that we know so well, many of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. And he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So how is it? Who is going to heaven to live with God forever? Those who are born again. Those in whom the Spirit of God has come and radically changed them. Well, how does this happen? How are we born again? Well, when we put our faith, our trust, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again and presented, him to the Father, presented himself to the Father as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, then guess what? The Holy Spirit comes in and does that radical change. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked to the Lamb of God? Have you ever placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has made sin for you and for me? Have you ever been born again? Well, if you have, what David is going to do in the next one, two, three, four verses in Psalm 15 is give a picture of what your life ought to look like. And if our lives don't line up, if we don't have a desire for our lives to line up with these last four verses, then we have to ask ourselves this question. Am I born again? Am I fit to dwell with God for eternity in his holy hill? So let's look at this. Verse number two, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Here are the people who are going to be populating the streets of heaven. Those who walk uprightly, those whose manner of living is sincere, those who live without hypocrisy. 1 John 2, 6 says, he that saith he abideth in Jesus on himself also to walk, even as Jesus walked, sincerely, without hypocrisy. He that worketh righteousness, he that does what is right. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, there's that verse that we love to quote, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet verse number 10 says that if we have trusted Christ, if he's done that work of grace in our lives, then we are his workmanship created unto Christ Jesus unto good works. We're saved by grace and then created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In 1 John, if you're having doubts about your salvation, I would invite you to study the book of 1 John because it tells you how you can know that you're a Christian. But throughout that book, and in particular in 1 John 2.29, 1 John 3.7, it says a person must be born of Jesus in order to live righteously. So walk uprightly. Work righteousness. It says in verse 2, he that speaketh the truth in his heart. In his heart, which means sincerely. He does not speak one thing and mean another. There's no hypocrisy, no deceit, no double meanings, no white lies, no flatteries, and so forth. What characterizes God's people here? Sincerity and the desire to do right. Are we perfect? No. But these are what characterize our lives. Verse number three. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Backbiteth not with his tongue. Talking about people in an injurious way behind their backs. He does not attack their character without them present. That's one of the characteristics of a Christian nor doeth evil to his neighbor. Now Jesus explains who our neighbor is. 
They ask him about that. It's whoever we're near. So if you're sitting next to someone right now, that's your neighbor. If you live next to someone, that's your neighbor. If you live in a community with someone, that's your neighbor. If you're on Facebook all over the world with someone, that is your neighbor. And so you strive in your life as a Christian to do nothing that would harm anyone else. Third John 11 says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Wow, these are some strong warnings in the scripture, are they not? Verse number 3 of Psalm 15 says, Nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. The word reproach literally means to strip or to make bare. It literally means to deprive someone of his clothing. Now how do you put this in? It's not talking about us going up to someone and ripping off their clothes. What it's talking about is when we're quick to believe what others say about someone. When we're quick to take up and pass along what others say about someone. When we shame another person, that is wrong. That is wrong. Over in Romans chapter 1, we'll turn over there. It talks about those who are given over to a reprobate mind. And of course, in this passage, it deals with the unnatural acts of homosexuality. But along with those un unnatural acts of homosexuality, it deals with other sins as well. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Now I remember uh, my pastor in Kentucky, Brother Edgar McKinney. People would say, well, why do you preach on what you preach on? And oftentimes he would talk about things like robbing God by not giving, not giving your tithe. Or he would talk about you know, people gossiping or talking about each other. And there are some of the bigger sins that maybe they felt like he wasn't dealing with enough. And he said, well, the reason I deal with these sins here is because this is what you're doing. <laughs> and these are the sins you need to hear about. The others that you'll say amen about, those aren't the ones you need to hear about. But these are. And so in Romans chapter 1, those who have a reprobate mind include those whose lives are characterized by being whisperers and backbiters. That is those who talk about people behind their backs and those who stab people in the back as well. And that's not what we're to do. God's people do not talk negatively about others nor try to do harm to them. Instead, we understand our own weaknesses that we need to deal with in our own lives. We've been reading a book as a family by Thomas Akempis called The Imitation of Christ. And one of the things he talks about over and over again is, you know, how do we pick out the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye when we've got a beam in our own eyes? And my kids love that picture, just that big log hanging out of your eye, and you're saying... Get that speck out of your eye. You know, that's such a, such a, such a picture there. And, and that's what we need to focus on is our own weaknesses and being right with God ourselves. Back to Psalm 15, verse 4. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. The word vile here literally means reprobate. It's the same word from Romans chapter 1. Uh, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, which means despised. In other words, a Christian doesn't flatter wicked people, perhaps even because of their station 
in life. We never, when someone is acting wickedly, ever let them think that we're okay with their sin just so we can get in good with them and perhaps even get something or get a favor from them. Instead, the ones that we honor are those that fear the Lord. We highly esteem those people who want to please God with their lives, no matter what their standing may be in the world. That's a temptation, is it not? Many times the wicked seem to flourish in this world. David talks about that in the Psalms. And the righteous seem to be the ones that never seem to get ahead. And if we want to succeed in this world, we tickle the ears and we flatter those who are wicked, who have that authority and that ability to help us out. And yet the Christian does what? We don't gloss over sin for personal advantage. Instead, we defend and we stand up for those who want to please God. Another thing we're to do, says, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. A Christian keeps his word, even when it ends up costing him greatly. I always think about my childhood, and I think about when I hear this back at Hatcher Memorial Baptist School. I don't know what grade I was in. I went there through the third grade when they shut down. And I remember a little boy sitting beside me. I had a big bag. I don't know why my mom gave me this, but she gave me a big bag of Reese's Pieces. And back then, candy was a big deal. Now it seems like candy's everywhere. And this little boy asked me, can I have the rest of your Reese's Pieces once you're finished? And I remember saying yes. And then when I realized I couldn't eat that whole big bag, and I had a lot left over, I started having second thoughts. And then, oh, he, he put a little guilt trip on me. He said, well, the church I go to, they don't give us candy. I remember that. But I gave it to him. Even though I was hurting, I wanted those Reese's Pieces later. But yet, guess what? They were gone. And that's a silly example, is it not? But what about a contract? You agree to do a job for someone, and it ends up being far more than what the estimate was. What do you do? Well, maybe you can ask them for that money, but you need to do that job if you agree to do that job for them. In Joshua chapter 9 and 10, we see the Gibeonites and they flat out lied to Joshua. But Joshua didn't go to the Lord and ask wisdom for it, and the elders didn't. And so they made a treaty with these Gibeonites who said they lived way far away and tricked the Israelites into believing that. And yet three days later, they found out the Gibeonites were lying. And you know what those rascals the Gibeonites did? They got attacked just a short while after that. And they came to the Israelites, and they said, you made a treaty with us. You need to defend us. And I bet the Israelites lost soldiers. But Joshua didn't say, you lied to us. Forget about the promise we made to you. He said, we made a promise, and we're going to help you out. And sure enough, Joshua came in there and won the battle for the Gibeonites. What is that? An example of this. He swears to his own hurt and changes not. God's people keep their word, even when it's not necessarily to their advantage. And verse number 5 says, He that putteth not out his money to usury. Now the Old Testament law forbids one Israelite from lending money to another Israelite with interest. Some examples, Exodus twenty-two twenty-five, 25, Leviticus 25, 37, Deuteronomy 23, 19. But they could lend out money to, to Gentiles, to other people, with usury. But even in that, we are not to extort money from people by charging extravagant interest. Loan sharks, payday lenders, cash advance people. These people who have these high interest rates taking advantage of people's poverty. That's not what Christians do. We give, and we don't give expecting interest, but to brothers and sisters in Christ, we just give because we love them in Christ as our brothers and sisters. And for those who are outside the body of Christ, if we charge interest, which I think there are some people who are Christian 
you know, pawn shops and things like that, we don't charge an exorbitant interest. But instead, we just charge something to make back a little bit on our money. It says here that Christians do not take reward against the innocent. That's called bribery. We do not allow our judgment to be warped by gifts from others. So God's people do not financially gain at the personal expense of another. That's not the way we live. So, how does the psalm end? All these characteristics have been given. A Christian is to be sincere. He has a desire to do right. He doesn't negatively talk about other people or seek their harm. A Christian does not gloss over sin for personal advantage. Or, or a Christian instead defends those who want to please God. A Christian keeps his word even when it's not to his advantage. And a Christian does not financially gain at the personal expense of another. So what do we see the last words of Psalm 15 are about these people? It says, He that doeth these things shall never be moved. That's eternal life there. You want to see a picture of a Christian? Look at Psalm 15. This type of person will never be moved. So, are we honoring God and treating others in a right manner? If not, then I believe God invites us to examine our hearts to see if we've truly been born again. Let's look at one final place, and then we're finished. Matthew, chapter number 7. Matthew, chapter number 7. Speaking of the judgment day, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Jesus warns in Matthew 7, beginning of verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's not the one that talks the talk, but the one that walks the walk that's truly born again. Verse 24, a little children's song goes along with this. Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And I believe this rock is Jesus. And the rains ascended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which buildeth his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. We want to have a life that will not be moved when the storm of death comes, but that will stand firm throughout eternity. And Jesus says the characteristic of a life that is not moved is one that hears his sayings and does them. But the characteristic of one whose life falls is one who hears his sayings and chooses to simply ignore them. Does that mean we're perfect this side of heaven? Absolutely not. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 8 and verse 10 both say that if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. But that's the desire of our hearts. And that's what the Spirit of God gives us the strength to do. To hear and to understand the words of God and then in turn to do them by honoring God and by being right with our fellow man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this psalm, Psalm 15, which gives us the characteristics of a Christian. For those of us who are born again, help us to meditate on these things and to practice these things in our lives. But Heavenly Father, if there's no desire to do these things that have been mentioned, we pray you'd work in that heart, show that heart, whether or not that heart is born again. And if that person is not born again, we pray that you would convince that person of his sin and that you would show that person the 
the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. Help us, we pray, to be true Christians. In Jesus' name, amen.